have any questions, go ahead and type them either in the comment section if you're on YouTube, if you're on you now. It's that weird little white box situation on the right hand side there. And the opening topic tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about um, kind of what happened at the end of last school year and how you're planning on prepping for this school year so that you can grow as a teacher. And that's going to be like the opening topic. If you want to talk about something else, let's go. Put any question in there and we'll talk about anything you want to. If you are listening to this on SoundCloud because you have that app and you're listening to the podcast, you can go ahead over to YouTube and leave comments or you can DM me or email me and I'll try and get back to any question that that is coming my way. And so that's that. Guys, I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks so much. My guest this evening is Mitchell Meehan, who is a teacher in... Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania. I, I was sorry. I was just looking at Instagram. I was getting mixed up with other people's stuff. And he is here to talk with us. He, I found him on Instagram a while ago, and I really liked the content that he was putting out. And I thought that he was someone that would, you know, be able to help you guys out and share a lot of information with you. So I'm going to guest him in now, and we'll jump right into the show. As soon as I find him. There he is. All right. One second. Guesting in. Here we go. A little song dance. Mitch. Here I am. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I think we're good. Good, man. How are you? Not bad. How are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. I had a house full of way too many kids today, <laughs> and uh, that was madness because they all started playing with Nerf guns, and that just equals chaos. Um, oh, man. <laughs> so that, that's that's pretty much my life, though. Um, nice, man. Hey, can you do uh, me a favor and just kind of give a little introduction of yourself? Because I feel like you'll introduce yourself way better than I will. Um, yeah, yeah, good. So I am Mitchell Meehan. I'm a teacher in Northwestern Pennsylvania. So I'm originally from Pittsburgh, but I live in Erie now. So right at the top of the state on that little notch, uh, right by the lake. So I'm about uh, maybe three or four miles from the beach. Um, love hanging out there in the summer. I teach at a high school on the west side of the state, um, almost near Ohio. And I teach 11th grade high school English mainly. And I will also have freshmen and seniors next year as well. I was going to say, yeah, you're moving over to freshman territory, which is my, yeah. that's my jam. Yeah, um, I'm a little scared, but we'll see. I've been teaching freshmen for a long time, and I just, I love it. I think it's, it's the best. It, it should be an adventure for you. We'll, yeah, we'll see. I'm excited to see how it goes. Um, so listen, earlier we talked a little bit about, like, this idea of um, growth as a teacher, right? Where you have, you can either become the teacher that, like, you get your systems in place, and then you just ride that out until retirement, or you have more of like a growth mindset and you're trying to take what you did last year and kind of reevaluate what you did and then do something new this year. Um, so do you, assuming you, this is what you've been doing, um, is that something you've done from the beginning? And when do you do that? Do you do it over the summer, during the school year, real quick before school starts in August? Or, or what's, what's like your layout look like for that? Um, I'd kind of say it's probably a mix of everything you just said. Um, so when I, when I first started, we're at, our, my school was on a semester schedule. So I was noticing, you know, starting over in January, doing the same thing over again. I'm like, wow, this is my second time through this, doing it, you know, three times a day. So I was kind of just started to get tired of it. And I, so I just was starting to realize, you know, I need to keep changing something, not just for my benefit. So I don't get, you know, burnout, but so the students are, you know, I'm responding to them and their needs and seeing what they need to do and what, what needs to be changed for them. So I kind of just, you know, after my first year, decided I really just need to always be reflecting and, you know, what can I change? What can I do to do better? Always finding something uh, big or small, just that I could be, be changing at all times. Yeah. So, um, for you, what does that, what does that process look like? Do you like look over your old lesson plans? Do you talk to other teachers? Um, like how do you figure out like what you feel like you did well in and what you didn't and then how you're going to change that kind of stuff? So for me, I mean, I definitely reached out to other teachers at first when I first started. Um, I think I'm a little bit more comfortable with it now. So what I do is really try and get to know my new group of students first and then kind of look at what I want to accomplish and what I need to change so that it will kind of suit their needs, um, depending on the group or the class period uh, for that for that semester. So 
I always have, you know, we always have a bigger idea of what we want to accomplish in the back of our heads, but I'm just kind of trying to, I try and refine it so that it will, it will work best for, for the particular group that I have at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that's really important. I think too, is like this year's freshmen well, for me and year's freshmen aren't going to necessarily ref be like uh, a good, I don't know, indicator of what next year's freshmen are going to be like, like the exactly. year's so different and the classes that you get. So I've had friends that are like, we'll have a, a group of ninth graders come in and they're like, my classes are a nightmare. They're like the worst kids I ever taught in my life. And I'm thinking, ah, it's kind of going pretty well. But then if I see some of their kids in the, in the hallway, I'm like, oh, that's why you're having an issue. Cause like, I see, I see what we're dealing with there. And it can be really tricky. Like even in the same grade, you might just, you know, get the luck of the draw and get the best kids. Or like, you might get the ones that are more challenging. Um, and so, you know, over time, like my, the way that I assess that, I mean, I assess all year. So I do it like at the very end of the year, I do right, right at the beginning of the school year, where I think of like, what did I do well in last year? What didn't I do well? And how can I either amplify the stuff that I did well or like get help on the stuff that I didn't do well? And, you know, if you make that, you know, for anyone new that's watching, that new to teaching, if you make that your kind of like your usual thing, uh, right. people really want to reach out. I think it's inspiring to other teachers to see you like, kind of reinventing yourself when necessary and never kind of doing the same thing. Um, right. And hopefully that inspires other people to do the same thing as well. Uh, and I mean, I'm a big believer in, you know, what worked one time for one group of students might, something might've been awesome. And then you think, all right, definitely going to keep that. We'll try it again with this group. And it's just a flop. If they didn't yeah. respond well to it or just not into it. Um, you know, even just period, class period to class period, there can be two or three, you know, big personalities that can really swing the way things are going to go. So I, I think it's just always important to, you know, be looking at, looking at what you're doing, what any particular group that you have and, you know, seeing what's going to work well for them. Yeah. And that, you know, that can take a lot of time or you could do stuff like I've, sometimes I just use, like I talk to my phone and I like take notes that way. And I'll just speak into my phone and say like, this didn't work in this particular thing that we were working on or this book, like, totally fell apart this year. And, you know, I don't understand because it's worked for three years in a row and this year it flopped. Right. And so just being able to like keep those notes is really, really a good idea. Um, Cause it just helps you grow more. What's that? Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking to my not so secret wife over here who's whispering. Um, so I, we have a question up here that says, how do you balance taking time for yourself during the summer while still adequately preparing for the next school year? Uh, how do you deal with that so far? So this was my first year where I really vowed to myself, I'm not going to be at school all summer. You know, I really started to get burnt out at the end of last year. So I, you know, I promised myself when I walked out on the last day, I won't be back here until August when we're back for the school year. So, you know, I, I obviously work on some things at home on my own time, um, just from my house, on my iPad, I'm sitting on the porch or whatever. But I really just promised myself that, you know, this was going to be the summer to just be, you know, the summer and have fun made it a little bit easier this year because I was really busy with just traveling all over the place and I had lots of different plans. So it was easier to kind of put school on the back burner just for those couple of months. But I just think it's important for, even throughout the school year on the weekends, you, you have to just step away at some points, you know, take some time for yourself, do things with your family or your friends. Um, Cause you know, once the school year starts, you're never gonna be caught up. There's always gonna be something else you can be changing or something else you can be doing. And you could yeah. work on it 24 hours a day. So you really just have to set time aside for yourself is what I've, what I've really kind of discovered in the last year. You have to just step away at some point. You, you know, you can't stay at school till six o'clock every single night. There's gotta be a, you know, a finishing point, you know, that something, whatever that is, you can work on it the next day or the next week. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that makes a ton of sense because like the work is never done. Like you're never ever finished or completely caught up. Uh, and so it's funny when I first started teaching, my wife would always ask me like, are you done yet? Are you finished doing what you're doing? And I'm like, nope, it never is ever done. Like I could always make something or tweak something or make it a little bit right. better, or cater it a little bit better towards a certain group of students. And it's just never finished. So you really have to make like deliberate time to exactly be, like, so you're doing what you, what you're supposed to be doing. And I mean, I've talked about this before. Um, I'm going to forget what the, what the rule is called, but there's, um, Parkinson's. Oh, I'll forget. But I'll, I'll, if I think about it, it'll come up.
but there's um, sort of like a theory that says uh, anything you do will take the time that you give it, right? So like if you give yourself just an hour or two to work on schoolwork in a day or in every week, whatever it is, like generally you can get it done in that amount of time. But if you give yourself a whole week to work on one particular project, it's going to take up that whole week. So you should sure. like, you know, like put it into a slot, like tell yourself, give yourself a schedule and fit it in there. And I feel like that works really, really well um, for me anyway. I mean, I, other people might say that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. And, do that. and that's why I think the continuous reflection is important because, you know, if you, it can be a simple task as, you know, fixing your syllabus up so it looks the way you want it. You could sit there and do that for days and it might take you two hours and you've only done the margins and the font. But if you say, you know, I'll just take an hour to do this, but then if you continuously reflect on it, okay, I need to make these three changes next time. Or if you're just, you know, reflecting and not trying to make everything perfect at one time, you know, set some time aside for yourself, and then you can maybe fix it the next time around. Yeah. Who is there someone at your school or that you knew in your life that practices that really well that like that's like you can kind of glean some inspiration from uh not really i mean i think it's it's hard for anybody to just walk away i mean i can think of teachers that you know sit at school till six or seven o'clock at night but you have to um you know they see you leaving and like oh I'm, you're so lucky that you leave right now i have to do this this and this and i think that's where that piece comes in where you need to make that conscious decision for yourself. Okay, yes, I have to do this, this, and this, and 10 other teachers have to do five other things also. So you just need to, you know, kind of draw the line at some point for yourself. Because if you're just turning yourself out, keeping happy, then, you know, you can come back in the next day refreshed and ready to go again. Yeah, 100%. Um, Mark Year asked, do you think it's important to change up your room every year? Because I think that it is for both the students and myself. How, how much is your room change in terms of, of anything, decoration or like organization wise from year to year? So the last couple of years, I've pretty much just, I haven't necessarily changed it. I kind of just keep adding to it. And now I'm pretty much out of wall space. So that's something that I've been thinking about over the summer is, you know, what can I, what can I take down? What can I change? You know, I see all these cool classrooms on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and everything. And they have a different theme every year where it's Harry Potter and everything's Harry Potter themed or something like that. Yeah. That is just completely overwhelming to me. I mean, I would love to do that. I think that'd be, be <laughs> awesome, but I don't know how I don't have a brain that works like that to think of a theme and then go with it for an entire year and decorate for that theme. So I kind of just have, um, I don't necessarily change mine every single year, but like I said, I just update things, new pictures. I have pictures everywhere. Um, uh, different posters, um, you know, even just moving things around in the room, rearranging the furniture or, you know, moving some things around on the wall just keeps it, um, keeps it fresh. I definitely have stuff to look at everywhere because I would drive myself crazy if I walk in and it was just white walls everywhere. So there's tons of stuff going on, but, um, yeah, I don't necessarily say for me that I change it on a regular schedule. I kind of just, as I get new things, hang them up or put them, put them around the room. Yeah. There's, you know, there's something to, I always tell new teachers that like, you're in your classroom probably more than you're going to be in your own home. And so like, if you think about how much time and energy we put into like decorating our homes, like right. why wouldn't your room look half as good as that? And so, right. and there are, I mean, I get it. Like kids mess stuff up all the time. Like, so when I first started teaching, uh, I wasn't mindful of that. I thought, sure, they'll be careful. They won't mess my stuff up. And now, um, I find that when you're bored, you just like put your hand in the air and then you like start touching all of my posters and then eventually like they get ripped off the wall or something like that. Yep. So now all of my posters are out of arm's reach. Like no one can touch anything that's in my room. Yep. Um, I also start putting them in frames so that like they don't, I don't have to put holes in them every year because at both mm -hmm. schools that I was at, you had to take everything off the wall so they could paint every year. Um, and I, but I do like to make my room better every year than it was the year before, even if those are like little tweaks, because I, part of the reason is totally ridiculous. I want the kids that I had last year to come in this year and go, man, our room wasn't this good, or you didn't have that last year. Yeah. And I kind of built this culture in the school where like the kids will come in every year and see like what was different. And I really, so I get, I don't know, I just want to like, impress uh and that's all about me it has nothing has nothing yeah. to do with learning um but i just i like that because i like the way that that sort of reputation um 
I don't know, gets passed off to the incoming freshmen where they're like, uh, it makes, I don't know, it makes my class seem like it's going to be kind of better than they thought, or they hear the kids talking about me and I, I will, I'll take any help I can get with incoming right. freshmen. I don't know who I am. And so, yeah, it's all about reputation, but, um, you know, I found, and I found that they take ownership over it too. You know, if I change something, if I get a new chair or a new, you know, hang up a new something or do something a little bit differently, students that I've had before will come in. Well, how come you didn't have this when we were here? How come you did this? Or you, yeah, them to, you know, they take ownership of that space because they're there for so long. And then when you do yeah. make the changes, they, they notice it and they, you know, kind of get a chip on their shoulder. If, if they think it's better than it was, or if it's just different, yeah. they, they definitely notice. Yeah. You have to stay exactly the same because you don't want to like mess with anyone. Um, yeah. you have to, how much do you have to like, uh, pack up your room every year though, or like take things down? Is there like a big process before the beginning of the year getting ready for school? Um, so my room's cool because three of the four walls are magnetic. So I have a lot of stuff on magnets. So if I do have to take it down, I can just kind of slap it right back up there quickly. Um, awesome. we don't, we're lucky that we don't have to take everything down every year. Um, they do clear the rooms out furniture wise and, uh, clean the carpets. So I have a bunch of stuff suspended from the ceiling that kind of hangs down. And my first year, I didn't realize they were going to clean the carpets. So they put a big fan in there to dry everything out and everything just blew everywhere. I came back oh, in wow. and like everything was a mess. So now all I do is take the stuff down from the ceiling that's kind of um, not fixed, you know, that's movable. Yes. I take that stuff down the flat, like I have a football flag and stuff like that. Take all that down so it doesn't get destroyed. Take the pictures that are hanging from the ceiling down. Um, everything else that's flat against the walls that I luckily can just stay up over the summer. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, the Scottish Teaching Ninja, which is one of my favorite names on YouTube, asked, what advice would you give teachers who find it difficult to implement change? Um, that's a really great question. I, I mean, so how many years have you been teaching now, Mitch? I just finished my fourth. Okay, so have you noticed, like, younger or older teachers that, like, do you have a problem changing? And like, what would you tell them like to try and inspire them to, to change? I mean, to put it kind of bluntly, I think you have to. I mean, the, the world is changing. The, the world that we're preparing the students for is always changing. So to do the same thing every single year for five or 10 years is really just doing a disservice to the students. So, you know, even if it's obviously easier to not change anything, you can write a year's lesson plans and do them one time and then do that for the rest of your career. But that's yep. really not preparing students for what they need. So I think just kind of driving home the, the message that it's essential to just always be changing, doing things differently, because every single day, the world that we're preparing our students for, like I said, is just different. I mean, this year's freshman class, um, four years from now, we're going to have a new freshman class and we're going to be preparing them for a different post-secondary education and a di totally different ball game than what they have now. So I just think anybody that's, you know, resistant to change, big or small, you just have to, I mean, it's important. You just have to kind of drive, drive home that message. Yeah. I, I, at the end of the day, I think it's more fun too, right? Like, so you put in the work, but if you don't put in the work, what's the alternative? You're going to be, you're going to eventually become bored of what you're teaching and how you're teaching it. And there might be those kind of perks that pop up. Like there, there are some things that I do that 12 years ago when I started teaching, I do like I start my year the same way. And I just, there's a couple of things that I either came up with or I like secretly stole from other people and they just work out great. And they're fun to do every year and the kids love them. And so they never change, but there's tons of other stuff that I'm like, ah, that's, I'm, like, this is a great idea, but I don't get pumped about it like I once did. So I'd rather come up with new ideas. And to be honest, like, between Instagram and YouTube, there's so many ideas out there now of, like, that you can see people doing stuff. And it's like, yo, I'm totally taking that idea. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. And I just flat out steal stuff. And then I always, like, DM people. I'm like, yo, just so you know, I took that game that I saw on your Instagram that you did. Um, but, uh my, this guy that I follow who goes by the hipster teacher on, on Instagram, he's always posting like really cool stuff and he teaches a very similar grade and, and his classes, his, his humor is similar to mine. And so I'm always like stealing his stuff. And then I post things on Instagram. He's like, did you, I'm pretty sure you took my game. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure I did. So, uh, senior S's Spanish spots asked, 
what's your best tip for switching up an activity that was a flop mid class? So have you ever had anything that just went totally wrong? It sucked. It was a failure and mid class, you got to like figure something else out. And then oh, what did you do with that? Of course. Um, so th that can go a couple different ways. I mean, I've had times where you kind of just own the mistake and they, you know, they get it. This isn't working. You guys aren't having fun with it or you're, you're not getting it. So let's do this instead. You kind of just have to, you know, think on the fly. Um, it's impossible to plan lessons where you have a backup plan and a backup backup plan every single day. So you kind of just have yeah. to kind of live in the moment, I think, and just see, you know, what went wrong and just try and think on your feet. How can we change this real quick? Even, you know, asking them for some feedback, what, what will help you get this better? What do you need from me to, for this to work? So I think just being afraid to not, not just not being afraid to to make those changes on the fly. If you notice that something's not working, just change something. Do I mean figure something out? And even if the second thing or the third thing you do still doesn't work, then you'll I mean you'll figure it out eventually. And I think that's an important lesson for the students to to understand is that things aren't always going to maybe go according to plan or going to how it's not always going to work out the first time. So just kind of you know be very candid with them. This this is what we are going to do today, and we're going to change it up because this is not. <laughs> It's not going to cut it right now. Yeah, I, I think that's huge. I mean, I do that like whenever it comes up. I won't say it's constantly because that would just right. sound like I never plan anything <laughs> good ever. But, uh, but that idea of saying, you know what, this kind of sucks. I'm, like it's not even always the student's fault. Sometimes it is. And I'll tell them like, I don't think you guys can handle this because this is a nightmare and you're not handling this like as maturely or, or the, in the way that I wanted to, or something's off today. And yeah. so sometimes I'll push something to the next day and I'll say, if I feel like we can do it tomorrow, we'll do it tomorrow. And so I typically, after this much time, I have like backup plans that are sometimes not always fun, but there's <laughs> something to do. So like I'll have the kids like write in a journal or do independent reading work or um, start homework early. But if, if I messed something up, if I think that like my plan sounded good on the drive into work and then when I got there, it totally sucked. You, right. I think you're right. You just say like, you know what? This sucked. How can we make this better? Like, what would you do if you were in my shoes to make this better? And to be honest, sometimes some of my best lessons come out of that because the kids take ownership of it. They're excited that you're doing what they wanted to. And really... I don't think there was one time ever when I was in high school that a teacher said, well, what do you guys want to learn about? What do you guys want to right. do? What would you rather do instead of this? Um, right. That wasn't in a sarcastic tone. Uh, you, you know, that so, I never had a teacher that was like honestly looking for some sort of feedback. And that blows kids away, I think, when you do that kind of stuff. Because, you know, and it also lets them see that you're, you know, human. a normal human being too. And like you screw up stuff and it doesn't, mm -hmm. not everything goes well all the time. And even sometimes I think, you know, they might be flopping for half the class, but some of them are really, you know, taken to what you actually plan. So, you know, let that half run with it then and then figure something else out for the other ones. You know, guys, you six keep working. I think you're doing okay, but what, let's, you know, you, you guys come over here. Let's work this out and do this in a different way. I'm big on student choice. And I think, um, you know, if I plan something for the whole group to do in one way, but then it ends up working out kind of differently for others, even if, it was unintentional. I didn't plan it that way. You know, if, if they are figuring it out and they're, you know, making it work in their own way, let them, let them run with it. I think that's a big part of the learning process. Yeah, totally. Um, there was a question on here. Jennifer Morris asked, she said, I'm in college and I'm 43. Uh, when should I find a mentor or teacher? Did you do like, so did you go the classic route and do like student teaching and all that stuff as well? Me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I did at my school, we had three like pre student teaching placements that were kind of tiered in terms of like the first one was just observation. And then you kind of got into the room a little bit more, maybe with passing some things out and circulating. Then the third one, you started with some, some lessons and implementing the lessons and then, um, full student teaching. I did a split placement, um, nine weeks at a, at a elementary school with eighth grade and then nine weeks at a high school with, um, 10th and 12th grade. And so during that time, did you have like a mentor teacher, like someone that kind of broke down what you were doing right or doing wrong? And like, how'd that go for you if you did? Um, so my first place, the teacher that I worked with, like my cooperating teacher was awesome. She was super reflective and, you know, would work 
sit down and ask questions with you. And then, um, so a lot of my friends that were in school only had one. So if you get like a bad experience, then you just kind of, kind of got to ride it out till the end. So I had a good one and then I had, an, it wasn't bad, but she was just, um, you could tell she didn't like to give up control of the classroom. So I definitely learned more, you know, from the other one who was willing to work with you and willing to, um, you know, help me reflect over what I was doing in the learning process of learning to become a teacher. And yeah. I think that's a lot of times that's something you probably don't have control over. Um, it's kind of, you know, the, the situation or the environment that you're put placed into plays a big role in that. And so you kind of just got to work with what you're given um, in that situation, I would say. Yeah. I, you know, I still, um, well, for years anyway, I kept up with the guy that I student taught with because he was, he was like the teacher that I wanted to be. I never knew him beforehand, but w once mm -hmm. I went into his class, I just knew like from the way that the room looked to the fact that he was an older guy. He, um, older, uh, he's close to my age. Well, now I'm close to what his age was, but, uh, I think he was 43 when he started teaching and he, um, retired from, he had like made a lot of money on his old business, yeah. retired, and then always wanted to be a teacher. So he went in and he wore a suit every day because he came from like the business world and like sh shook every kid's hand every day uh had kids always like doing all these tasks for him so like the workload didn't all fall on him but he was just he was like the greatest teacher i've ever seen awesome. in my life and so for years after that i kept up with him and i felt like it was really important it was someone to that you know sometimes sharing things with your colleagues and saying like you know, I kind of screwed this up or like, I really messed up. I don't know what to do. Or this class is a nightmare and I'm not sure how to handle it can be, you're kind of like putting your failure out there in a world that might not, it, I don't know, it might turn into drama or like, did you hear that? Like Mr. Reynolds doesn't know how to handle his class instead of like a supportive, you know, group of people like it should be. So I think finding a mentor could be really important. I mean, you know, one of the great things about being on YouTube is I get e um, like emails and DMs all the time from folks that are asking questions and then I'll do like phone calls with them or just email back and forth and help right. them work stuff out. So uh, I think there's stuff everywhere. And so to, to that question, to I, Jennifer, I think her name was, um, you could just hit, you know, hit people up. If you find someone on YouTube or Instagram that you really like or you think that your teaching style is geared towards who they are, I'd say email them or DM them and, and ask them flat out like if they would help you out with stuff That's yeah I would agree with that if you're I mean if you're in a school even if you know you get your first full-time teaching position if the colleagues that you have aren't receptive to giving you feedback or you know helping you out reach out to anybody that you can find online Twitter Facebook Instagram anything and I think you'll be surprised with you know the responses that you might get back um, maybe not from everybody but just there's tons of people out there just willing to help you know I've done the same thing if I have specific questions about specific things I reach out to people that I've seen share information about that topic and it's always yeah. i've always i've never had anybody you know not help me out even if it's just a couple minutes a couple quick questions a couple quick responses i think you'll be surprised with how willing people are to help other people in the profession yeah I, I mean if you can put yourself in a group of teachers that are willing to help one another out it doesn't get any better than that because honestly see no one understands teacher problems like teachers it's like if i go home and tell my wife She's like, well, why didn't you just do this? And I'm like, I can't always do that. And my wife is, my wife, my, she, she, she's shaking her fist at me right now. But it's, uh, it's, it's, um, I, I do think, and I'm not saying this just because she's sitting next to me, but she is really supportive. But there's just, there are like nuances and rules and things that teachers can sort of identify with that like not everyone always kind of understands if they're not a teacher. Yeah. Um, and I think it goes back to that student group things. I mean, I'll go back to teachers who had this group maybe last year, like the 10th grade English teacher yeah. or people, a teacher that I know had them in chemistry the semester before. And you know, I'm just, you know, you just got to ask, what's the deal with this class? What is, and then they usually can offer something. Yeah. So-and-so and the other kid. And when they're together, they do this, this, and this, and try this with them, but this will probably won't work. They're not receptive to that. And just always, you know, always ask, find someone to ask. Can't hurt. Yeah, that's really great advice to go back to the old teachers and, and touch base that way. That is that can be really, really huge because you find out things that like, I mean, I found out terrible things about students were like, right. 
Oh yeah, their their mom passed away last year, or their grandmom has been sick for a long time, and they have to pick up slack at home. And you had no idea, right. and you're now right. you know, and that kind of informs the way that you're going to handle the situation, even in class, and maybe like have a little bit more grace for a kid, um, or you know, like when like no, that kid has no reason to do that. You need to come down a little bit hard on them, or or like be real strict with them, and that can inform that kind of situation as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. We're getting a question from uh, my friend, the Scottish Teaching Ninja. Do you have any personal goals for next year? That's a question for both of us, she said. Uh, what, what, is there anything in particular that you're trying to do better this year or that you want to achieve or want to do this year? So automatically so, for me, for next year, having freshmen for the first time and having seniors for the first time, that's already going to give me you know, some new things to work on. Um, I definitely want to change some things around for my juniors too. I have my new um, position with my um, with Apple with my Apple Distinguished Educator designation. So I have a lot of stuff that I'm working on through that. So I have tons of ideas all over the place with stuff I'm trying to just you know improve on um, and get better. A big driving factor for me for next year is the fact that I have a student teacher for the first time. So you know I want to be at the top of my game, um, showing her how she, you know how she can learn to be at the top of her game too showing her, you know, things that I've done and how I'm changing it and, you know, working with her to see, you know, what, what's going to work best for us together in this class for this school year. So yeah. I have, I got stuff going on next year. Yeah. That's, you know, I, I feel like, uh, the school doesn't give me that much stuff to do from year to year. Like, I, I mean, I could like, I, the way that I make decisions usually, and I, I feel like, uh, there's, who said this? There's a, a writer named Derek Sivers who uh, started this company called CD Baby that he sold. And he said, when when you're asked to do something, your answer, like when you think of, so uh, the school comes to you and says, could you run this program or could you lead this pep rally or could you take care of like, would you be willing to coach? And your answer when you're thinking of this should either be yes uh, or, or it should be no or hell yeah. And if the answer is not hell yeah, like if you're not that pumped about it, you should think twice about doing it. And so when I first started teaching, I did anything I was asked. They'd be like, oh, would you, you know, write the new, like work with the newspaper and, and put out a newspaper? I don't have any experience in putting out a newspaper. I totally sucked at it. It was like the worst newspaper ever. Uh, or would you be willing to direct the play? Sure, I'll direct the play. <laughs> My second thing, I'll do anything you ask. I never, I was in a play once in the mall in New Jersey in the sixth grade. That was, that was all of my experience. But I did it anyway, because I didn't, I didn't know I could say no. Right. And so, but when I started saying no and looking for opportunities in which I thought I would really do well in and I could add something, then that changed everything. And so Absolutely. this year I have all kinds of fun stuff coming up where we have like, uh, I do a maker program after school. And so, to the Scottish Teaching Ninja, my, my answer is, yeah, like I want my maker program to be even larger. We started a school store last year to, to fund oh, cool. our uh, class trips and that we made like this tiny little store out of plywood and we sold tons of stuff and it helped fund our trip. Last year, we went abroad for the first time ever uh, to Costa Rica with a bunch of students who had never left the country. And so this year, we're trying to fund a trip to Greece um, to, we do like a cruise around the Greek islands. It's, this is really just my way of like planning trips so that I can continue to travel <laughs> to amazing places and not right, pay of for course. it. Um, but I, I love that idea of planning all of these big things out during the year because it just makes the year, it gives you something to look forward to, something to be excited about and a way to change up what you normally do. So yeah. And I'm teaching a new class this year as well, which is the co-taught reading class that I'm doing for the first time. And I'm really, really looking forward to it because I get to write the whole curriculum, which is a little bit daunting, but kind of awesome because I can do anything I want. Um, right. So yeah, I'm this year, I keep telling my wife and my some of my friends that this is going to be the best year I've ever had. Like, I'm just deciding now that it's going to be the best. So uh, and I so, think you kind of have to go into this. I think if you go into every school year with that attitude, you know, this year is going to be the best. Well, if it's going to be better than last year, then what are you going to change? It kind of, you know, yeah. brings everything back full circle to how we started the conversation today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next question is, have you ever worked with another teacher that wasn't, that was unwilling to collaborate? If so, how did you approach that? Uh, I don't know. Like, so I don't know. I see your school on Instagram and it looks beautiful, but I don't, I can't, I don't know what kind of school you're at or like, um, 
but like did the teacher stay for a long time do they do they not and so how do you deal with something like that with collaborating with other teachers or if they don't want to like if so someone's not really digging what you're into like how do you deal with that um i think you just kind of gotta you can only do the best you can if if you really firmly believe in something and they're just you know really opposed to it for whatever reason um if you really feel that it's right and you need to be that's something you need to be doing then you just gotta kind of gotta go with it and you might ruffle some feathers along the way i've certainly been there but um really it just comes down to you know what how you feel in your position and what you're what you're trying to do for your students um i don't think everybody wants to collaborate 100 percent of the time you may be forced to work with a certain teacher for um, a certain class or i've seen other teachers who are teaching new classes that other teachers have already taught and you know just the transition doesn't go well so you can only really just do the best that you can with what you're given um and i think you just need to you know keep keep your mind on the students and their benefit and just just kind of go from there yeah so being in a co-taught classroom the last few years i've had uh, a lot of different teachers in there with me and no one has stayed they all like some people stay for like a day some people stay for six months some people a year and then they split and not all of those folks have I like kind of just not not gotten along with but like we just didn't work well together like their view on classroom management was much different than mine and we're in the same classroom every day so if I typically handle things with building relationships with students or talking one-on-one, -on -one. they would just like put kids on blast in the middle of the classroom. And then I'm like, yep. Ooh, then you kind of feel like it kind of takes you back to when you were 10 and like your best friend was getting yelled at by his mom and you're in the house and you don't really know what to do. It's all awkward and weird. And so that just becomes a really big challenge. And I think, you know, the best way that to deal with that is to really just have those hard conversations and say, look, we're not going to see eye to eye, but like where, how can we make this work? There's no way out of it. So let's just make this like the best that we possibly can. And, yeah. um, and then be willing to give and be willing to really listen to other people. Like, don't just go in with what you think is the best idea. Uh, how can you meet in the middle with some of that stuff? And you'd be surprised how that works out. Um, I also say like, if someone doesn't really want to kind of get down with you, like invite them out go out to dinner together or find like have a, I don't know, whatever you're into, like a game night at your house or you're going out drinking with everyone or something. I feel like I say going out drinking a lot. That's my recommendation a lot of the time. I don't know that that's a healthy one, but anyway, it works, um, the time. It works a lot of the time. It, it, that kind of stuff builds relationships outside of the classroom. And it makes you, if you can be friends outside of school, that changes everything at school. Mm -hmm. Like you, you have something else there and not just, the kids and the workload and the, you know, how much, how tired you are. Uh, that's my friend, Kate, the sleepy teacher saying happy hour was invented by a yeah, teacher. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it because Couldn't it's, agree more. you know, I always tell new teachers, like go, you have to go out with everyone. Even if you're introverted and you're socially awkward, try it for 10 minutes. And then if you mm -hmm. don't like it, just dip out the door. But, it just makes everything better. So whoever, even if you don't get along with someone, you might hit it off, you know, while you're sitting there having a couple of drinks and they might become a real person and not just like that yeah. miserable curmudgeon that's in the back of your room or down the end of the hallway. <laughs> um, what, that one? Uh, Cassie is asking, what is your number one tip that you would give to an aspiring teacher? I get that question a lot. Um, what what would you say number one tip um i feel like there's a lot of stuff that you can yeah. do so it's like um would come out of i don't know your top 10 so what's I, let me ask you this way what you could even say like what's one thing that you wish you knew that first year that you went in to teaching um i would just say we've already kind of touched on it a little bit but just it's never going to be perfect um yeah got to find a way to just whatever you have run with it at some point and then figure out what's going to work and what's not. Um, you know, I, I wish I knew when I first started that just, it's not always going to be perfect. It's not always going to go according to plan and you just have to be flexible. Um, you know, I think through college, you kind of learn that, okay, you have a lesson plan and this is the plan for the class. And 
then that's your plan. But you, it's what you really learn is how you respond to when something, you know, changes from that. So if the fire alarm goes off in the middle of class and you had to have this done by the end of the period, well, now you're not going to. So you, yeah, as much as you stomp around and pout about it, it's not going to happen. So you just need to learn to be flexible when things are going to change. Um, you know, students can get into a confrontation in the middle of a class because of a lesson that you're in the middle of and you know how you just need to learn that it's not always going to go according to plan um kind of just respond as you can to whatever situations come up and then just go with it yeah i i think another thing i i love telling new teachers is so everyone goes into the job wanting to be a certain kind of teacher and then there are folks that will go like a hundred percent and, and pursue that and try and be that kind of teacher. And then there are folks that like kind of, uh, I don't know, keep it like they don't, they don't go that, that extra effort right away because they're nervous that like they're going to look funny or they're trying too hard or what people are going to talk about. And they wait until they have like tenured or something like that. And then they feel like they're going to go like put all their chips in. And I just think that's the worst idea that you should go in, that first year you should go in even before you start teaching, like being with this mindset that you're going to be the kind of teacher that you always wanted to be, or that your students always needed and, and think like to hell with that, what everyone else has to say. Um, one of the things I loved that one of my college professors had us do was this was back before Pinterest. Uh, we had actual binders and as we would come across <laughs> things like lessons or uh, projects, she would say like print them out or write them down in your binder and then, the binder was all like uh, it was cut up into like pre-class ideas and homework mm -hmm. ideas and project ideas. And so when you started teaching, you already had this whole big binder full of ideas of things to pull from so that yeah. when you were stuck or when you couldn't think of an idea, that's where you would get all your stuff from. So yeah, I would say like start being ready now to be the best teacher, like go and sit in, call your local high school and say, Hey, um, whoever you're, last five teachers of the year were, can I come and sit in on their classes? Uh, or yeah. go find out who like the worst teachers are in their school and sit on those classes too. So you know like what, how bad it can get and what you don't want to be when you become a teacher. It could be a good thing also. But um, yeah, start now and just plan on being like the greatest teacher that you possibly could ever be. Yeah. Do not hold back for one second because you get set in those routines and then you never end up being that person you always wanted to be. Yeah. So that's my, I guess that's probably my biggest tip is just the flexibility, learn to be flexible, learn to kind of go with the flow. I don't, I don't understand the teachers where, you know, the school plans a pep rally or an assembly or something and they get all bent, bent out of shape because, well, we were supposed to read this today. Yeah. You know, I, I don't ever pretend like my class is the most important going thing going on in anyone's life because it's just not, I mean, if we, if we never read that novel, we'll do something else and we'll, you know, you can figure it out. So you just have to be flexible. Um, you know, even if you don't get through everything that you want to get through or things don't go the way you thought it will, would um, just got to be flexible. That's yeah. Well, and like, like you said with the fire alarms, like you just never know what's going to happen, right? There's been a hundred times where I'm like, I walk into school, I have my lesson ready, but I didn't like make copies it. And I find out like the copiers don't work or, you know, Oh, there's an emergency meeting for everyone in the morning. Or, you know, there's a speaker today that we forgot to tell everyone about. And so, uh, you know, it's, we actually had, um, whether it's to people's excitement or their chagrin, we had Betsy DeVos showed up at our school last year and like, no one knew about it. And apparently they couldn't tell us because like the secret service can't like let right. you know in advance. And all we found out was like, like halfway through the day, it was like for the rest, the kids are getting sent home early and we're not going to have like a full day of classes. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? I'm like, I'm all set to go. And they're like, yeah, we can't tell you why. And then we see like this entourage pull up in the parking lot. I was like, Oh, what, like, what the hell is going on here? And so that was, uh, you just never know. Betsy DeVos might show up at your school. Right. <laughs> um, learning out, learning about our life asked last year at my school, we did co-teaching or we did co-teaching and I loved it. We got along so great this year. I'm changing schools and they do cohabitat. Have you participated in Cohabitat Classroom before? Any advice? I, I think I know what this is. Are you familiar with? I'm, um, no, I'm, I'm definitely not familiar with what that means. This is related, you said? Yeah. Um, 
it's been several times when I can just I don't I'm seeing if something else comes up about this, but uh, it's like co-teaching. Each teacher has their own room. So my friend, Miss May, who has a YouTube channel called uh, One Fab Teacher, I think this is similar to that. We're like, no, it's no, not. No, it I is. Think, I think you're right. So it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't see the total benefit of it, but all of the classrooms, imagine like you're in, um, your school doesn't have any walls that go to the ceiling. So they're all about eight feet tall. And there are no doors. There's like curtains between the rooms. So you can hear all the other classrooms. And the idea, I think, behind that is to sort of like give this communal feel where there like are no hard separations between classes. For me, that sounds like a nightmare. I think for other yeah. teachers, it could work really, really well. I'm super loud all the time. I'm always doing loud stuff. Um, one of my classes, uh, I teach a, a hip hop elective. It's the history of hip hop. And every Friday we have ciphers where like I have a DJ come in and we play music really loud and the mm -hmm. kids have like a battle every week, like a rap battle on Fridays. And that would be a t like, no one else would be able to do anything. And, right. and I know my friend, Miss May, who teaches in a class like this, they have dance parties every so often, but she has to do silent dance parties where she'll play music really low. And then the kids like silently dance on top of their desks. Well, that's no and fun. she sent me videos of this. It, sound, it looks hilarious. <laughs> but that is just not part of who I am. Like being quiet is not part of who I am. So I, I feel like that, that type of school would be, it would depend on the individual part of me would be excited of, of the challenge. Like, well, how, yeah. how could I change what I do to be like more respectful of the people that are around me? Because the guy that teaches next door to me now is like just as loud as I am. And so mm -hmm. we, we kind of balance one another out. But um, yeah, I feel like it would be a personal preference. Is your, what's your classroom look like? Is it like? Our, we have just regular classrooms, walls, doors, you can shut it. So I, I get the open concept thing. I think it sounds, cool in theory but like you said i don't think that would be you know for every minute of every day we my school is kind of cool we have some big collaborative spaces where you know maybe me and two or three other teachers will take our classes out there and they're kind of working amongst each other at certain times which i think is awesome i love like seeing the freshmen with the seniors and they're even though they're doing different things they're all kind of in the same place laying on the floor yeah. or sitting at desks or whatever they know know each other from the basketball team or from sports or whatever you know they're still getting their classwork done all of us are out there circulating and it's you know it's really a cool concept but the the idea of just an open concept every minute of every day i don't i don't know how that would i think that'd be hard to manage i love the idea uh, of collaboration though I, but i i think for me it's more i see more of a benefit of having collaborative spaces to use you know when the time is right yeah so you get to choose instead of like it being yeah. kind of like your your normal right. um especially with smaller children i feel like I, I don't know i my sense of what elementary school looks like is like i would just have madness in my classroom all, in a good way i mean I, um but that would be more like even when i play with my kids like we rarely do something quiet uh even when we play video games together i have a seven and a ten year old we are all it's like super loud and you're like yelling at the tv right. uh she so the follow-up to that was she said we have our own rooms with walls but breakout spaces in the hallway. So that sounds like yeah, so that's that's cool. A bit more, um, that would be awesome. I'm yeah. at I'm in the middle of West Philly. There's no, you know, there's no breakout spaces. Uh, I do occasionally go outside, but even that is kind of weird because the kids know everyone in the neighborhood, and everyone in the neighborhood's walking by, and they just like want to hang out or say what's up, or like right. someone's uncle walks by and they want to come kick it for a while, and you're like. We're in the we're in the middle of something, man. Well, I'm in the middle of a lesson here. This is uh, we can't do this right now. Um, next question is what what made you want to become a teacher? What what was the the motivation behind that? So for me, I can remember back to I just had really awesome groups of teachers in middle school from sixth, seventh, and eighth grade back to back. Had we had a team concept, you know, where you had a social studies teacher, math teacher, science teacher, and you rotated between them on your team, and then there was another eighth grade team and another eighth grade team. So for three years in a row, I had just had really good groups of teachers. I felt like they all, I can just remember them getting along really well together. And it was just a really awesome experience for me. So I knew like going into high school, the teaching was something that I wanted to do. And then, um, I don't know, just never really changed my mind, kind of stuck with me all through high school. Um, 
I did change my major from math to English um, when I was in college, but it's, I, you know, I still stuck with education. Just, wow. just knew that's that I wanted to do. Yeah. That's like two opposite. I, I always make fun of math all the time. When the kids yeah. come in and they don't want to do work, I go, look, like this is the most important subject of the whole day. So like, you know, yeah. so I always dog math, but what, what about your, your families? A lot of times I'll get folks on here that are like, uh, their family just thinks that, you know, you're never going to make a lot of money. You're not going to be able to kind of like, it's, it's very, very stressful, uh, for not a lot of money. D did your family, were they supportive? Were they excited? Were they, you know, how, what did that look like growing up? Yeah, I would say supportive all the way. I mean, um, never really had the discussions like salary wise, you know, this isn't a good career path for you. Kind of just, my family's just always been supportive to, you know, whatever you think you want to do, go for it. And, that works. But most of my families, um, actually we have a lot of hairdressers in my family randomly. And then there's a lot of people in the medical field. So I definitely kind of paved the way in a different direction. I, I guess you could say by going into yeah. education. Cause I don't have anybody else in my family that's an educator. Yeah. That's funny. Because but I feel like a lot of teachers from that, they come from like the teacher family and then they mm -hmm. was also, um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I never, no one even went to college in my family. Like when I went to college, my family was like, what are you, what a waste of money. What are you doing? Like just get a job. Like that's right. what everyone does. And, and all of my uncles and my dad were in the union. And so it was like a total shoe in to get into the union. Right. But, uh, now I do this and everyone was like, what, wait, I'm not so sure about this. And, uh, but now they love it and they love whenever we have holidays or like, it's a total feeling of, well, what's going on in school? Like what's been, what's been happening, whatever happened to this student. And everyone loves that. Uh, especially my grandmother, she came, even came in once to like sit in my school. Uh, she's yeah. 85 years old, but she was just so thrilled and she sat in the back and she's so proud of it. And she still That's talks happy. about that, like coming in and like what that looked That's like cool. and meeting the students. And it was really fun. That's cool. Uh, Next question is, if you could teach any other subject that you're not certified in, what would you teach and why? I love, that's a great question. Uh, would it just be math or, or something else now? It actually probably wouldn't be math. I did end up getting my math certification once I finished college, but um, I don't know. I think the science teachers really have some cool stuff going on. I just feel like uh, with different lab experiments and the different projects that they do, I feel like there's really just a lot of opportunity to kind of give some real world examples in terms of the, the, the labs that they do. So maybe I, I guess I would say science, but the thing that I don't like about science, it's, it's so specialized. So, you know, I'm really not into biology, but I think chemistry is kind of cool. So I think yeah. for science, cause I toyed around with science, majoring in science for a little bit in high school. But like I said, you kind of have to go, seems like you have to go super specialized. I mean, that, that might, that might not be the case. Um, but I just think, I feel like the science teachers always have, always got cool stuff going on. Yeah. I, I, in, I think in my school, there, there is a general creators take, but then they also take biology freshman year as well. I mean, okay. everyone does kind of get slotted into these like certain things that you're supposed to be teaching. And I think that's, that's tricky. I, I feel like so much of school is like the luck of the draw. Like I wanted to teach ninth grade and luckily my first job, I just got it. And then my second mm -hmm. job, I just got it. And I, hold on to that. Like, I don't ever want to get moved out of ninth grade because that's matches my personality. But you know, if you get a job in an elementary school, you could teach anywhere from K to six in a lot of schools. And you don't know, like maybe fourth grade's your dream, but you end up getting, you know, if they offer you kindergarten, you don't know if you're going to get another job somewhere else teaching that dream. Right. So you got to kind of put your time in. I think I would go science also. And I love, I I love subjects where you can go a little bit deeper with stuff. And that's why I love English is like the books are, I mean, I, I pick books that I can have deep conversations about and te help kids to learn more about who they are and what interests them and what kind of makes them tick. And I feel like science would be that same thing where you could go yeah. like down rabbit holes and like, um, and really kind of like learn stuff uh, in a really fantastic way plus yeah. i would want a room that just looked like like a mad scientist's you know like a laboratory yeah that's the same from like a 1950s horror movie or something it would be like dr frankenstein's yeah wearing a lab, lab coat every single day 
Dude, I would be yo. I would totally wear. It. I would look like Beekman's World or something like that. It would be. Uh, it would be awesome. Um, next question. This is. I've never gotten a question like this before. So see uh -huh. how this works. Define teacher in three words. What what three things kind of like make you, or make you think of like what a good teacher is or who you are as a teacher. Um, I don't know if I can do it in three words, but I think the I think <laughs> for me a big thing that makes or breaks a good teacher is just the ability to build relationships with your students. Um, there's teachers out there that are just very you know cut and dry. You're here to learn this in and out, and then that's it. But I think those teachers that can really you know, get to know the students on a more personal level, um, yeah. which is why I've had a lot of success with English. You know, we do a lot of um, personal narrative writing and, you know, ask, I, I like to learn a lot about them and what they have going on. And I just think that really builds a stronger connection. You know, they, they get more buy-in if they know that you're there to learn more about them. Um, yeah. I think for me that that's, that's huge. I think any good teacher that can build relationships is that's, that's number one for me, for sure. Yeah. Um, I think when I think about, I'm thinking relationships also a hundred percent. That's my biggest thing that I've, that's the reason I've had any success in the classroom is by building relationships with students. I think craft yes. is important to me. Like people don't think of teaching as a craft enough. Like there's so many times that um, I've worked for like uh, teach for America. I don't know if you know this organization, but yep. um, where like I've mentored their their teachers in the summer before they start teaching. And these kids have done great at everything in their whole lives. Like they've always like been at the top of their class or they're really good at whatever sport that they were in or the chess team or whatever it was. And then they get into teaching and the kids don't care about that. And that's not a good predictor of whether or not you'd be a good teacher. And they don't like, I see this not just in TFA, but like in other, anybody that's right. coming into school that, if they're not good the first year or the first week or the first month, they just want to quit because they, they don't see, like they just think they're not good at it. And it's like, but what thing, pretty much everything that you try, like unless you're a savant, like you have to get better at, whether that's right. riding a bicycle or swimming or cooking, you don't try and cook the first time and go, hell with this, I'm eating top ramen for the rest of my life. Like you right. have to get better at it. Like, and yeah. you will get better at it. Just take your time. And I, and I think, the last one really is, uh, is honesty. I think being honest with like who you are and being honest with your students and not talking to kids like they're little kids, like being yep. for real with them and, and talking to them like they're adults and being honest is, is huge. Um, yeah, I think that's huge. You know, you just gotta be transparent with them. This, this is what it is. Um, if they disappoint you, tell them they disappointed you for these reasons, you know, just level with them and, you know, don't, like you said, don't talk to them like they're, they're not humans. Let them know you are human too. Just level with them. Yeah. Huge. Uh, so we're at about an hour. You got time for one more question? Yeah, for sure. Cool. So CC Moffitt, who's on here a lot, asked, uh, what are some memorable team building activities that you've done with teachers, uh, your school or your students during the first week of school? Our teachers love to escape the class, escape the classroom. Look at your school being all up on stuff and the amazing race. Um, I, I hate team building activity and I'm super extroverted, but, uh, have you done anything that you really have? Like, I'm trying to think of stuff, but have you done anything that you really have liked? So the thing that sticks out to me the most is, um, when I was in Houston last week for my Apple, um, at the Apple conference, we, they kind of grouped you as you were coming in during registration. So they would grab just five of you. So all of a sudden I was with five people that I'd never met before. They handed us a box. I don't know if you're, um, I forget what they're called, breakout, breakout EDU or something, but it's, um, it's like a locked box. They handed you the box. They handed you a timer that was set for 20 minutes and they handed you a piece of paper. So the clues are on the paper. It's kind of like one of those escape rooms. So you had to read through, figure out what would open the first lock and the second lock. And it okay. was, it was just an awesome experience to, um, we had no idea what any, any of the clues meant, what any, anything was and never seen each other from before in our labs. We're all from different places across the country, but we were, you know, all of a sudden forced to kind of work together on on this thing to, to get to break out of the box and it was just a really really fun experience um it was short 20 minutes it was, but it was just cool to work through you know we had some math teachers it just all we all taught different things different areas and you know some of us were good at some of the parts and other people were good at the other parts and just seeing everything come together 
to get us out of the box um, in time was just cool. It was really fun. Yeah, that's, uh, that is a good idea. Um, I'm thinking of in the beginning of the year, one of my first project that I do is before we read the Odyssey, I have the kids put together a really simple PowerPoint or poster board if they don't have a computer mm -hmm. and they have to create an Odyssey of their life of from when they were born to who they are now and like how they became the individual that they became. Yeah, and cool. this takes a little longer. It's not just like a, like a something you would do in a PD or in just a class, but what it does is kids, first of all, share incredible stories about their lives that okay. really inform you as their teacher. Like, you know, maybe their parent died when they were younger or they um, have moved a lot or their parents are in the military and they're constantly having to change their whole lives around. And it really gives you a sense of who every kid is and everyone wants to talk about themselves. Like even quiet kids get like excited to talk about when they got their first cell phone or how great they are at football or whatever. And it also gives the class a, um, a chance to figure out like who they might connect with. Like, Oh, you like poetry also, or you like parkour or you're really into like gaming right. and you have a YouTube channel or whatever. Like, it really gives the kids a sense of like who they want to connect with because at our school, most of the freshmen don't know one another because they come from all over Philadelphia. So it's, right. it's like this, um, you're kind of like advertising for yourself and then you find your group after that. And that has been cool. totally invaluable, especially for me. It's really a sneaky way for me to get to know who all of my students are and like who yeah. does good presentations even and who doesn't, who's confident enough to stand in front of the classroom and who is scared to death to stand in front of the classroom and, and present something about themselves. So yeah, I yeah, just, I, love I do something similar to that. We do, do autobiographies. Um, we, they ha I have them write an autobiography book essentially by the end of the semester. So it's just kind of, I chunk the writing assignments, tie them to the literature that we're reading at the time. And so they write them throughout the semester. Then their final project is to, there's guidelines and everything. They basically put together and they kind of gripe about it through throughout the entire semester. But then when they see the books, I print them and bind them and hand them to them. And when they see the books, they really want to see each other's. I tell them, you know, this is just for you to take home. And um, once they see it, they, you know, they want to pass them around. They want to see each other's stories and they want to see the pictures that they put in. And um, it just turns out to be like a cool kind of bonding thing that they all, you know, they all leave there with like a story, their own story yeah. about themselves. And they want to end up sharing them with each other by the end. That's awesome. That's such a great idea. Um... So listen, man, I really appreciate you coming on, Mitch. If, uh, if what am I thinking of? I'm thinking of two things at one time, which is terrible because I can't multitask ever. But uh, could you tell everyone real quick before you go, like where can they find you on social media? All right, so I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, my handle on all of them is at Mr. Mian with an underscore in between the Mr. and the Mian. Um, you can just search my name on there. It should pop up. Uh, I think I'm the only one. I'm the only Mitchell Mian around i think it's a pretty unique right. name. <laughs> so that's it i'm up there if you have questions or if I, um if, if i said anything that kind of sparked an interest in you or you want me to elaborate on anything i love meeting new people i love talking to um, people from different parts around the country so reach out and i'll i'll get back to you for sure cool awesome and, and i would also say to anyone that's watching that if we didn't get to your question or if it blew by uh too quickly because on you now it's really hard to keep up with the questions although we do our best go ahead and leave it in the comment section below and I, I will answer any question that's left. And Mitch, if you want, you can like, feel free to go under there and answer any question that's directed towards you or, or even not directed towards you. If you feel like you want to like add your two cents about something or connect with someone um, cool. for everyone that's watching, I'll just say that next week I have my co-teacher Miss Yonkers is used to be the head of special ed department at my school. She's going to come on and we're going to talk uh, specifically about special education next week. A lot of people have been asking about that and it'll be um, a really great thing to be able to do. And all of Mitch's stuff will be linked below so that if you want to find him on social media, you'll be able to just click on the link and find him. So Mitch, thanks a lot for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. the invite. This was fun. Thanks so much. All right, man. Talk to you later. Peace. Yeah, take it easy. See ya. That's it, folks, for this week. Again, next week, my friend, Miss Yonkers, who if you want to get a little uh, kind of preview, you can check out her blog at Polka Dots of Gratitude. And I will try and link that as well. And my paper's flipping over. Or bethany.joy.yonkers on Instagram. She has a great Instagram. And she's just a wonderful human being. Next week, we're going to be just on YouTube since she will be in my house and we can just stream from there. 
Uh, and that'll be that. Thanks so much for uh, watching, guys. I really appreciate it. Peace.